Hi, this is Larry Greenblatt. Welcome to episode two of how to pass the CISSP exam using Kirk and Spock to help us qualify and quantify our answers. Uh, today's episode is on domain two, asset security. Now, very quickly, I've gone over this in the first uh, module, but the first episode, but I want to instill in us and any CISSP candidate the difference between subjective and objective thinking or qualitative versus quantitative, say, risk assessment. Subjective or qualitative thinking would be like the subject here is the person playing the instrument and the object the thing they're playing. And the Bell Apagel model, the very first access control model, formal access control model, we looked at users as subjects and files as objects. We know that that's grown. It's a very relative relationship, but basically the subject is active and the object is passive. And so if you don't play the Vulcan harp, it doesn't do anything. Now, when someone plays the harp, they're making music on it. And if it's out of tune or out of time, no one's going to like that music. But if it's in tune and in time, is it good? Is that music good? Well, that depends on what a subject finds are, are, are the important qualities to them in music. So that's very subjective, whether or not music is good. I prefer Beethoven over Mozart. That doesn't make Beethoven better. Right? It's just that those are the qualities I like. But no matter who plays the Vulcan harp, they should count that there are 32 strings. In episode one, if you've watched it, I guessed made it 32. I actually looked it up. It's 30 strings. And there are four knobs. And no matter who measures it, if you don't come up with four knobs, then your, your quantitative reasoning was off. You had, to, you had to look at that more objectively. It's not a matter of opinion. So Spock and Kirk are going to help us uh, understand the answers of a test, and some questions are very quantitative. If they ask you, how many bits in an SHA hash? Well, there's 160 bits in that, and that's very easy. Any other answer is wrong. But a lot of answers really become more qualitative. Well, that's not the word that we would use, or that's not how we do it in our organization. Uh, so it, it gets a little tricky sometimes. So we're going to take the test. And I tried to rig these questions to where I can, well, it's usually uh, much easier to quantify an answer wrong than it is right. So I often, in my class, I, I throw a pen up in the air and I say, every time I throw this up in the air, I'm going to catch it. Well, that would take infinity to prove that right. But then I drop the pen and I go, well, I guess I proved that wrong. So when you take your test, I, I advise you to look for wrong answers first. And Spock will help us do that. Um, he can quantify or objectively look at an answer. We know that costs are very quantifiable. I can show you in a receipt what I paid for the Vulcan harp. But Kirk can tell you what he feels the Vulcan harp is worth. And very important words in our test are certification, accreditation. Well, certification is to be very certain. So Spock can be very certain that a particular system has, say, 16 gigs of RAM. But it's up to Kirk. A cred means to believe. Cred, like as in credential, it means to believe that something's true. So if something's incredible, you don't believe it. But if it's credible, so Kirk would accredit a solution. If the Spock is certain that it's 16 gigs of RAM, Kirk would decide: Do I believe that 16 gigs of RAM is appropriate for this particular solution? So we're going to do that on our test questions. We're going to have Spock. Uh, hopefully, he can prove. Maybe three of the answers wrong. Those are easy. But sometimes you can't prove any of them wrong, and then it's all up to Kirk. I've rigged these questions so I can prove uh, two or so wrong, and then it's up to Kirk to come up with the answer. Uh, big Star Trek fan ever since I was growing up, and one of the great things about Star Trek is that it really um, – it was one of the first TV shows to treat everybody equally, no matter what country or even planet you were from. And I thought that was great. And many of our test questions, many of the internet standards we deal with are from the ISA. And many people think this is a, uh, an acronym for an international standards organization. It's not. It's a word that comes from the Greek. It means equal. So, uh, for instance, if we all agree that red light means stop, then we can all share the road equally. And they develop standards for the internet so we can uh, share the internet as equals. All right. So I like to have Kirk read the question to Spock, and Spock goes over and tries to quantify the answers. A few answers is wrong first. So, Spock, Griffin Space Tank 
has accepted a certain amount of risk across their enterprise. To prepare for any realized threats, they need to gather key metrics. Which data classification is most likely of key interest? All right, what this question is saying, Captain, is that they have uh, done a risk assessment and applied some preventive controls. But there are certain risks they did not prevent. And whenever you don't prevent a risk, you need ways to detect and respond. And you do a business impact analysis. This is really in the realm of business continuity planning. So in a business impact analysis, we, we mostly look at the different process areas in uh, an organization, in the enterprise. What are the uh, availability metrics? You know, how long can I afford to be without a particular process area? The focus of uh, information security in the international standards, according to the ISO and NIST, is to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are the basic categories of classifications that we deal with, say high, medium, and low for availability, integrity, and confidentiality. In business impact analysis, we are looking for availability. People don't always use the same words. So Spock goes over the answers. Spock, is it sensitivity? Negative, Captain. Sensitivity is associated with confidentiality, as in sensitive medical records or personally identifiable information. This should be about availability, so it's not A. Is it integrity? Negative, Captain. Again, we are mostly dealing with availability as our key uh, concern when we develop our maximum tolerable downtime, recovery time objectives, minimum operating requirements, and recovery point objectives. I see, Spock. So would it be accessibility? I could see where that could work, Captain. Yes, you'd need to be able to access those certain systems. Yes, accessibility is another word that could be used for availability. What about criticality? Affirmative, Captain. It could also be looked at as criticality. That's another term used to describe uh, an asset that we need to get a hold of. Typically, we think of high-risk dangers. It's critical. So you're saying it could be C or D. Yes, Captain. Spock, I have a hunch. After working many years with Dr. McCoy, I've heard him very excitedly require certain assets, and he'd say, Jim, it's critical that we get this now. I feel the answer's D. Yes, <laughs> it is. And again, these, these two terms uh, could be used. It could have been accessibility. In fact, I've seen a few practice questions that use that, and I've had students get upset. Well, why couldn't you use the word? And the answer is you could. But most likely, the term would have been criticality. It is my experience that instead of saying confidentiality, Many organizations use the term sensitivity, and instead of the term availability, we often see, or I often see, the term criticality. So while Spock couldn't prove why it was C or D, it was a very subjective choice, probably was the answer. Yeah. The most basic ways to classify data are according to loss of confidentiality, commonly referred to as sensitivity, integrity, and availability, which is commonly referred to as criticality. And the context of the question is dealing with residual risk, right? After we prevented something, we accepted some risks. And the difference between accepting and negligence is that you have ways to detect and respond. And we prioritize ways to detect and respond, and we build our business continuity and disaster recovery plans by doing a business impact analysis. And we calculate some criticality metrics, maximum tolerable downtime, recovery time objective. Recovery point objective, how old can the, the data be? And minimum operating requirements, what are the services and supplies we'll need? So while the term accessibility could have been used, criticality is much more common in my experience. I hope that helps, and may you all live long and prosper. 
And if you want to know more, uh, I do teach five day boot camps uh, live online, or you could download pre recorded versions. And if you're interested, please send an email to sales at internetwork defense. And you can see our schedule at internetworkdefense.com. And I listen to a crypto coin guy.、Uh, if anybody listens to Ivan on Tech,、uh, he's one of my favorite crypto coin guys this year. And he's always telling people, remember to smash the likes and click the bell button.、Uh, and I never ask that, but、uh, what the heck? If you, if you made it this far in my presentation, why don't you hit the like? So apparently, that would help me.、Uh, thank you very much.、Uh, and I hope you look forward to episode three when I'll be doing security,、uh, engineering, and architectures.